In the previous section, we considered various factors that change supply. Now we're going to turn to changes in demand. Um, a lot of this is going to feel actually somewhat similar because there, there is a lot of similarities between changes in supply and changes in demand. So first, when we consider a change in demand, remember we're going to focus on changes in quantity if we want to get the direction of a shift. So if buyers are willing to buy more of the good at any particular price, then we'd say that demand increases. That is, we want to buy more of the good. That is, quantity at any particular price would increase. Or we'd say the demand curve shifts to the right, remembering that quantity is measured from left to right. It's on the horizontal axis in our supply and demand diagram. If buyers are less willing to buy the good, then we'd say that demand decreases or the demand curve shifts to the left. And graphically, it looks something like this. Remember, our demand curve is downward sloping. This communicates that at higher prices, all else equal, we tend to be willing to buy less of the good, while at lower prices, we tend to be willing to, to buy more of the good. If there's a decrease in demand, and that would be a shift of the entire curve to the left, showing that at any particular price, even if the price did not change, we're not as willing to buy the good as we were before. While an increase would be a shift to the right, showing that even if the price doesn't change, now we're willing to buy more than we were before. Remembering that demand, when we say demand, we're talking about a relationship between prices and quantities. So if there's a change in demand, an increase or a decrease, it is that relationship that is changing. When we say an increase in demand, the relationship changes so that at any price, we're willing to buy more than we were before. With a decrease at any price, we're willing to buy less than we were before. The relationship between prices and quantities have changed. Now let's turn to factors that shift demand. Uh, first, there are prices of goods that are related to each other in consumption. Now it's very important here that we, um, a lot of the terminology is the same between goods related in production and goods related in consumption. So we need to always keep in mind, are these goods related because they tend to be produced together, or I have to produce one or the other, or are they related in consumption? So first, substitutes. Now, if you remember, substitutes in production are something where the more you produce of one, the less you can produce of the other. In consumption, it's very similar in that if something is a substitute in consumption, it's a good where the more you consume of one, the less you tend to consume of the other. So you tend to consume one or the other of the thing. It's very much like, a, I think, of a substitute teacher. A substitute teacher tends not to be in the classroom when the regular teacher is there. It's either one or the other. So one example of that would be, say, the relationship between Coke and Pepsi. Generally speaking, we don't consume these two together. If you consume one, you tend to consume somewhat less of the other. Now the relationship here would be, if there's an increased price of Coke, that tends to drive people away from buying Coke toward buying these substitutes, in this case Pepsi. So there would be an increased demand for Pepsi, because Coke has become more expensive. On the other hand, if Coke becomes cheaper, people tend to switch away from Pepsi. So we'd see a decreased demand for Pepsi. With complements, once again, it's the same term we used in production, and it's a similar concept. While well, complements in production are things that are produced together, complements in consumption are goods that tend to be consumed together. So think of two things where we tend to consume both of them together. Now sometimes um, things are very strong complements. I think of left shoes and right shoes. Generally speaking, we consume them together virtually all the time for most people. Um, but some things are somewhat weaker complements that tend to go together, but not always. I think of things like hot dogs and ketchup. I personally, if I'm going to eat a hot dog, it's going to have ketchup on it, and I think that's true for many people, but not for everyone. It's perfectly possible for you to consume them separately, uh, but people tend to consume more of one if they're consuming more of the other. The same goes with substitutes. It's not that we never consume them together. It's just that on average, the more you consume of one, the less you tend to consume of the other. So with this example with complements, Say we have an increased price of hot dogs. Now, what that's going to tend to do is decrease the demand for hot dog buns. After all, if hot dogs become more expensive, I'm not going to eat as many hot dogs. If I don't eat as many hot dogs, then I don't need the buns. I'm not willing to pay as much for the buns. So demand for buns decreases. Continuing with factors that can shift demand, expected future prices. This is, once again, something that shows up that shifts supply. It also shifts demand but in a slightly different way. After all, if a buyer expects higher prices in the future, right, then that makes me more willing to go out and buy the thing now. If I think, for example, the price of gas is going to go up to $10 next week as opposed to three fifty or so that it is at the moment, um, then I certainly am going to run out and fill up all of my cars today. Right? That is, my demand right now increases 
as I'm expecting higher prices in the future. I want to avoid the high prices and seize the relatively low prices. So expecting very high future prices tends to increase demand right now. Now we could also reverse this. If I expect very low prices in the future, that makes me less willing to go out and buy the thing right now. Another factor is changes in income or expected income or wealth. Um, all of these tend to have very similar effects in that if I get a raise at work, I tend to feel wealthier. Or say I, I didn't get the raise yet, but I'm expecting to get, say, a big promotion, I tend to feel wealthier. Or if I, say, have an increase in the price of my house, that is my wealth goes up, then once again I feel wealthier. So these all three tend to have very similar effects. So we'll just describe them all together. Uh, but here what the effect is very much depends on the good we're looking at. Uh, for example, there's one class of goods we call normal. Uh, and the normal goods have the relationship where when your income goes up, demand for these goods tends to go up. That is, you're more willing to go out and buy these goods. Some examples of that would include things like steak. Generally speaking, if we would find that wealthier people would be more likely to cons consume steak than poorer people are. Um, the same goes for yachts, the same goes for housing. Right. All of these are things where um, the wealthier you are, probably the more you're going to tend to spend on these particular goods. Now other goods we would classify as inferior goods. Now one point here is that inferior doesn't necessarily mean that it's inferior in terms of quality. Um, all that really means is that when your income goes up, demand for these goods tends to fall. That is, as income goes up, you switch away from these goods. Um, I generally like to use what I call the Bill Gates test to determine whether or not something is a normal good or an inferior good. Um, if Bill Gates buys more of the thing than I do, then it's probably a normal good. If Bill Gates is likely to buy less of the thing than I do, it's probably an inferior good. So some examples here might include things like off-brand hot dogs. Um, generally speaking, as your income goes up, you'll switch perhaps to brand name hot dogs or perhaps to steak, so you buy fewer off-brand hot dogs. Another would be ramen noodles. Ramen noodles are rather famous for being a very cheap form of food, um, but generally speaking, as your income goes up, you tend to switch away from eating quite as many ramen noodles. Another factor that shifts demand would be a change in the number of buyers or in population. After all, an increase in population means that there are more people out there that could possibly buy things. Here, not surprisingly, if there are more buyers out there, then we're going to tend to see an increase in demand. Okay. If more people are born, or say if we have rather large immigration, we tend to see increased demand for various products. The final category would be preferences. Uh, preferences is really just kind of a catch-all um, other kind of category where we realize that sometimes things are going to shift demand um, that have nothing to do with the things we've talked about. It's not that a price of some related good changed. It's not that my income changed. It's not the number of buyers changed. It's none of these things. Um, instead, it's just perhaps you know, some change in my taste. Right? It is perfectly possible for me um, to happen to like something one day and then dislike it the next. Um, we see this a lot with what we call fads. Where I remember boy, when I was a kid, there were all kinds of fads that I lived through. We had things like slap bracelets. All oh, slap bracelets became outrageously popular and then virtually vanished. Um, we had things like little troll dolls, which were kind of these hideous little plastic things. Um, but people just absolutely loved them, and then they vanished. Um, we saw the same thing on a very wide scale with things like Tickle Me Elmo, with things like Beanie Babies. It became extremely popular. Very, very high demand for these products. It was you know, difficult for people to keep up with that demand in terms of production. Um, but then it seems like all of a sudden um, people just move on to something else, and, and these things are the tastes of the public have changed. Um, another thing that could possibly fall under preferences uh, would be any kind of new information we get. Um, so for example here, if we make the discovery that asbestos can cause cancer, right, then that's, that generally would tend to lower the demand for asbestos insulation, despite the fact that nothing else has changed. It's not that, a, um, say we've had a change in the number of buyers, it's not we have the mass immigration. Um, it's not that we have, say, a, a change in the price of a related good something that would be a substitute or a complement for asbestos. No, here it's just we got new information about the product itself that made us dislike it. Um, the same thing can happen if, say, we find that there are great health benefits to something. We would tend to see a significant increase in demand. This we would classify as a change in preferences. 
Now that we've covered factors that can shift supply and factors that can shift demand, well, we'll talk about how these end up affecting prices and quantities in the market.